welcome. Um, thanks for being here um, on this uh, nice uh, Sunday. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a presentation uh, about what we did at ArangoDB for Kubernetes. Um, so first of all, um, let me ask you a question. Who here is familiar with Kubernetes? Who's actually running Kubernetes already in something related to production? You should. Okay. Uh, who's familiar with ArangoDB? Okay. Well, some I know should be. Um, um, and who actually is already running ArangoDB in production? On Kubernetes or something else? Great. Okay, so then I assume that at least some things are uh, familiar. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about. First, I'm going to give you a short introduction into ArangoDB. Otherwise, marketing is probably going to shoot me, but I'll keep it short. Um, then I'm going to give a short introduction into Kubernetes. Um, try to keep it as short as possible. Um, and then I'm going to focus on how what options you have for running ArangoDB on Kubernetes. Um, and first, I'm going to focus on what options you had until, let's say, six months ago, um, and why all of these options are actually really crappy, um, and why we did what we did in, in creating a special thing for it. Um, then I'm going to introduce that special thing and talk about what it is and how you can use it and why we think it is better than what uh, we had before. Um, and um, finally, I'm going to dive deep into that. So that is really for the developers who are interested in what happens beneath the surface and why these things are actually fairly complicated. Um, and hopefully, if time permits and the Wi-Fi gods are with us, then we can do a little uh, demo. Um, all of the information um, is available uh, on our website already. Everything is available for download, so you can just use it. Um, and obviously, if there are questions, just I notice here questions in the end, but if there are questions in between, just ask. Good. Let's start with a small introduction into uh, ArangoDB. ArangoDB is a multi-model database. Uh, multi-model means that you can have uh, documents, you can have graphs, you can have key values, and you can have all of that in the same engine and the same query language. Um, and that's really helpful. Um, well, the statistics, um, Basically, it means we are growing like crazy, um, uh, but we're still one of the new kids on the block, um, but we are already at very, very high customers. So um, if you're looking at a single model, so before you had something like a RangoDB, you either had a relational database, or you had your document database, or you had graphs, and if your application needs, let's say, three of them, like, you need documents, you need graphs, you need a key value store. You need to have three different databases, all with their separate maintenance, their separate upgrade paths, all that stuff. Um, so that is a lot of learning. That is a lot of uh, cost involved in maintaining that. Um, and by putting, combining all of that in a single engine, um, you obviously, you still have to learn how to use a graph compared to a document, because even though they are in the same query language, a graph is by nature just a little bit different, but at least you can talk to it in the same way, you can maintain it in the same way, and that is really helpful. Um, and in the end, what you're doing is you're reducing complexity, uh, just by putting everything in, in, uh, in one thing. This is um, our query language. Um, for example, you can just have a query language and you can select and you can do all the stuff. It's not like uh, SQL, but it's in the sense that it's not exactly SQL, but it is very close and you can do some things that are a lot more powerful than what you can do with SQL. Um, and uh, again, that query language it covers all the models um, that we have. Good. That was everything that I wanted to introduce about Kubernetes. Uh, sorry about ArangoDB. Now let's dive into um, Kubernetes with first a introduction into Kubernetes. Um, and the big question obviously is what is Kubernetes? And if you look it up, you can look at things like, okay, this is actually a kind of operating system for data centers or however you would like to call it. Um, the Kubernetes organization itself describes it a little bit different, and they are talking about a system to automate deployment and in the end running containers. 
Um, and that's really all that it does. But it does that in a very helpful way, um, in the sense that you care, don't care that much about um, scaling. Uh, you don't care that much about migrating stuff, about making sure that things are kept running, because that is, in the end, what the thing is being meant to do. Um, and personally, I always think of it as just an operating system for clusters, for large clusters of machines where, um, in uh, like 20 years ago, uh, the operating system that we all know nowadays um, made it easy to run multiple processes on a single machine. It's now made easy, more or less easy at least, um, to run multiple containers uh, on multiple machines. And multiple machines can be as small as two or three, but you can also go to 10,000 if you want, or even bigger. Um, and as any operating system, it manages resources for you. And resources actually is a separate thing in Kubernetes because there is a, everything is described as a resource. Something about the uh, com uh, community around Kubernetes. Um, probably most people know that uh, Kubernetes actually started at uh, Google um, where they wanted, they had this big internal fight uh, about whether they should make their knowledge of running containers at scale, uh, whether that should make that public or not. Um, and in the end, um, the guys who advocated to make it public won uh, because we now have Kubernetes and still a lot is maintained or still a lot is contributed by Google. But uh, nowadays, this entire ecosphere of um, people involved in Kubernetes is really big. All the major players are involved uh, and contribute a lot. And the last thing that I have to um, note here is that um, Kubernetes is moving fast, and I mean crazy fast. Um, I know that many people have already said that it is only uh, already a day job just to keep up with all the changes in Kubernetes. And in all honesty, I think that's not even fair because I don't think that you can do it in one day because it is really ridiculously fast. So this slide is actually something for uh, also for uh, ArangoDB internally and that is why, why do we actually care about something like Kubernetes? Because, heck, we are building a database and how people run them, it's nice. Um, but in the end, it is really important that our database is being run in the right way. And lots of applications are being run now in Kubernetes. And we see that uh, where we had Mesos, where we had some other stuff, um, Kubernetes, at least right now, is just the winning orchestration system. And obviously, you can still do the things in Docker Swarm and you name it. Um, but lots of companies, also the small companies, everyone wants to be the next Google. So even if they have their application serving a couple of thousand requests a day, they still want to run it in a big scale and with all the features that uh, Google has. So there is a very big cool factor involved. Um, and while that is obviously not a reason for a business like Arango to be to invest in an effort like this. Um, it also helps because developers are attracted to this platform. So people want to, and we are actually being asked by our customers, um, do you already have that and how do we do that? Uh, and they just want us to tell them how to do it, which obviously is correct. But the good news, it actually helps Besides all the cool factor and all the crap around it, it really helps you to run stuff in production in a way where you can actually sleep at night and not be woken up uh, too often because things crash. Um, does that mean that the things don't crash anymore? Hell no, uh, they still crash. Um, but Kubernetes um, will take care that at least most cases where something does crash, it just restarts it and you don't even see it. Perhaps if you later look on it in your metrics and you see a little spike or something like that, that's fine, um, but the, especially the self-healing mechanisms that are in there are just great, and um, they, they help a lot. So, a little bit about the, the concepts that Kubernetes is using. Um, primary um, concept of Kubernetes is you describe what you want, not how. Um, you leave it to Kubernetes to actually do that. Um, so you describe in what you call resource specifications, I want to have a container uh, of this image running. I don't care where, I don't care how you do it, get it done. Um, 
which is great because you just tell it what you want and you don't have to specify every individual step to say, well, that means that you have to download that image, you'll have to start somewhere on a machine, uh, some process to actually run it. All that stuff you don't care about, you just say, I want to have this container running and by the way, if the load goes above this, scale it up to whatever you want. Um, that is huge. Um, and that uh, makes things in live a lot easier and also a lot shorter. And, and with everything that is distributed, and in the end Kubernetes is about a very, very big distributed system, uh, distributed systems are hard. They are fun, but they're also hard. Um, so if you can have a system like Kubernetes to make this for you and just say, okay, this is what I want you to do, now go do it, and then it actually does it, that's great. So you have these resource specifications um, and you talk to a Kubernetes API server, that's one of the elements of Kubernetes where you say, okay, this is the resource, um, please store it and now some uh, controller in Kubernetes is actually going to do something about it. That split of, I have my resource, I put that resource in some storage um, and then some other process is taking care that it's being done what you want. Uh, that is what makes uh, Kubernetes work. And there are lots of different types of resources. This is just a very small list. So you have pods, you have service, deployment, node secrets, but the list is much, much, much longer than that. And that's actually one of the things that keeps growing, especially also now that uh, Kubernetes has made it a lot easier to add your own types of resources. And that's what we'll later on see is what we uh, did. So just look at the basics. A pod, that's the smallest thing that you can deploy. So you can say, I want to have a container running and then it will, in the end, launch a pod to do that. Um, the downside of a pod is that a pod can die and then nothing happens. So there are higher th deployments, like a deployment, where you say, I want not only to run this container, but also to make sure that it keeps running. So if this pod dies, do something about it and just create a new one. Um, you have services, and a service is a logical set um, where you actually talk to um, your containers. So you don't talk, at least in many cases, you don't talk directly to your container. You just say this container or all the instances of this container that I want to have running provide a certain service, whether it is a website or a login service or whatever it is. And now this service, I see this service as a single point that I talk to um, over the network to access it. Which container actually handles your request you don't know, and in most cases you don't really care, except for some exceptions, which we obviously had when doing a database. Um, you have nodes where do things run, and you have secrets. Um, those are the primary resource types, and again, there are so many more, but let's start with these ones. So that's all nice, and now what options do you actually have to run a Rango to be on that? And, um, before I actually dive into that, I should tell you that you can run a RangoDB in roughly three different what we call deployments. You can have a single server, um, which is just like what it, the word says, it's one server. Um, everything is stored there, everything is done there. Um, obviously not that scalable, um, but very good and very fast for small applications. Um, you can also have a full, what we call cluster. And a full cluster, is uh, a thing where we make differences between types of servers. Um, so we have servers that are equipped to store data, we have servers equipped to handle queries, and we also have some servers equipped to control all these servers together. Um, and these have a role. And in a cluster, if we say we are starting a RangoDB cluster, that means that we are starting at least nine containers. So that is a big step from a single server, which is easy, you just install one container and then you go to nine containers. The, uh, the good thing of this cluster is that it doesn't only scale with taking bigger machines, it also scales horizontally if you take multiple, if you need more storage, just add more servers that do storage. If you need more capacity to do queries, add more servers that does that. So now I'm going to show, well, I'm not really going to show, but I'm just going to give you the headlines of what it would take um, without any help. So just taking bare Kubernetes, 
let's run ArangoDB um, with just bare Kubernetes resources. Um, single server actually is not that difficult. Um, I need a single container, as I already mentioned. Um, I need to store my data somewhere, so therefore I need a volume, and I need a service in order to actually talk to it. Um, those are three resources that you have to provide. Um, in, in Kubernetes, every, all these resources are described in YAML, and if you write that out, you can do that in roughly 60 lines of YAML. But obviously, it's already 60 lines of YAML, uh, YAML which to me is still a lot. Um, and then I don't even talk about upgrading, I don't even talk uh, about um, security like TLS or whatever, um, that's all adding to that. But we see that customers are actually doing this. Um, and before, let's say a couple of months ago, they didn't have any choice because this was the only way you could do it. And obviously the people that really know Kubernetes say, well, you shouldn't run this in a pod, it should be at least a deployment or a stateful set, absolutely true. Um, but this is just to show the basics. If you do that, which you should obviously, it just gets bigger. Now remember these 60 lines. Now we are going to make it fun because we're now going to run a cluster. Um, and running a cluster, um, I already said you need at least nine containers. So that ends up nine pods being three agents. Those are the ones controlling your cluster. Three DB servers, that's actually storing the data and three coordinators, that's where you send your request and that's where uh, all the queries are being done. Um, and we just need six persistent volumes. That's good, we don't need nine. Why don't we need nine? Because these coordinators do not actually preserve state. So they, we, they write something, but we don't care about that. Um, we still need one service, and that service is actually pointing towards these three coordinators because that's where you talk to. Um, if you write that out in this way, you need uh, 450 plus lines of YAML. So that is already quite painful, to be honest. If you try to print that out, it's taking a lot of A4s and it just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but still, um, sometimes this is just what you have to do because you don't have anything else. Um, and we actually did it, it works. Um, Obviously, we did it better with stateful sets and things like that, but um, it does work. But where are the problems? Because why did we do anything about it? Well, first of all, it is a lot of resource files that you have to write, um, and therefore the risk of getting things wrong are just growing and growing and growing. Um, but in the end, it's fine, you can make it work, um, and if you are just careful, you can get it right. It's not a problem. Um, and as I already mentioned, well, the pods can die, so let's replace them by nowadays stateful sets, which is great. Um, it's already a lot better. Um, and the question perhaps is, why do you need these stateful sets and not a typical deployment? Um, and that is that internally in this cluster, we need some kind of stability, like the, the machines, uh, all these containers need to know how to find them, each other. Um, so they need, for example, a fixed, fixed IP address. Um, and that's something that you can provide with uh, stateful sets. There are other ways of doing it, um, but this is the easy, easiest way of doing it. Um, but here's the big problem. As soon as you start upgrading the thing, because um, obviously ArangoDB has bugs as well and we add features, so we uh, tend to release um, at least bug fix releases on a fairly frequent basis. Um, and we actually encourage you to do upgrade because we know that we solve things in there. And upgrading is hard. Not just that you have to modify all this YAML in order to say, well, I'm now not going to use 3.3.13, but 3.3.14. Um, that's the easy part. The hard part is that um, this is a complex beast. And um, we have, and I saw that in the, you saw that in the previous slide, you have these different types of servers, and there are different rules on how you, you know, there's a certain order in which you can upgrade. So you cannot just say, well, let's at random replace things, because at some point you're going to end up with a broken cluster. That's pretty much the same as saying, well, I'm bringing down my entire cluster, replace everything and bring it up again, now it's upgraded. That's nice, but 
still your cluster is unavailable for some time and you don't want that. So in order to do that right, and that involves upgrading, but that also involves, for example, resilience if something dies, um, in order to get that right is really complex because a RongoDB in a cluster uh, approach is complex, like any database is complex. Having a persistent system on distributed system is just very complex and very hard to get right. Um, and obviously, if you just think of um, the semantics that are there in a stateful set in Kubernetes, um, they are there for a general class of applications. And this is a very specific class of applications with specific rules. And um, that is really screwing things up. So again, uh, just a sidestep to these uh, stateful sets. Um, yes, they are good. Um, if you don't have anything else and you want to have these stateful, please use them. But as I just mentioned, a database, not only a RongoDB, any database where you have this behavior, and especially if you want scaling and you want upgrading, and you want all these things, um, they require some special kind of attention. And you really need to know the details. And actually, when we started writing the thing that will come next, uh, we did find out that it is really helpful to write this um, very close to the people that know all the details there are to know about the cluster behavior because you will end up needing that. Um, and from the outside, that's just very hard to do. So what we needed is simplification. Um, again, a simple cluster, if you start stateful sets, is already more than 500 lines. Um, I mentioned the upgrade process. I don't even want to think about doing that because it's just not fun anymore. Um, so the first question that actually we asked and that we already saw people were using is, why don't we create a script that actually creates the YAML for us? Well, you can do that. It's not that hard. Um, and initially it works great. You just create a script and you say, take this version, I want so many of this, so many of that, go ahead, do it. And it creates a set of YAML files for you, you deploy them to Kubernetes and you're done, fine until you enter scaling, upgrading, whatever. Then you are stuck with exactly the same problems as you had before when you did it manually. Um, so again, we need to know a simplification. Um, fortunately, we have um, in Kubernetes what is called custom resources. A custom resource is um, a very nice invention uh, by Kubernetes where they said, well, we cannot put everything that people on the earth may ever invent into the code base of Kubernetes because it will explode. By the way, it is already exploding, so let's not make it even worse. Um, so if you have your custom resource, like we have with a deployment of a database. Oh, did I switch something off? Does it work now? I don't. Can you still hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I try not to touch that. Okay, so with a custom resource, um, um, you have two things. You have first, you have your specification of your resource. Um, and obviously, this is custom as well, uh, because Kubernetes doesn't know what you want. And the second thing that you have is something to actually take that resource and do something with it, make it actually happen. Um, and you have to write both if you want to build a custom resource. And that's what we did with Cube ArangoDB. And Cube ArangoDB is the project name for, um, we say here, a operator. Um, right now it's already three operators. I'll spare you the details for now. And a operator is just a more generalized term that is now being used for these things that actually control custom resources. So the primary resources in Kubernetes uh, are controlled by what is called controllers. And an operator is just a nice name invented by CoreOS, I think, two years ago, uh, that says, okay, you're specific to your custom resource, build an operator that actually does this thing for you. Now, how does this look like? I assume that most of you have already seen a resource for pods and what have you in a YAML file. And this is what a simple, again, keep in mind, these 450 lines of YAML that we had before, 
And this is one, two, three, four, five, six lines. And here I describe an entire cluster. So we go down from 450 lines to just six, which is kind of nice. Um, obviously, we can make it a lot bigger because I haven't told it which version to use. I haven't told it uh, a lot of things uh, that you can tell it. But if you just want a cluster, um, this is it. And this is what it does. So what do we have here? We have an API version. That is what you specify in your custom resource combined with a kind. So we have something called Rango deployment in the API version, which is basically a namespace, database arangodb.com slash v1 alpha. Uh, obviously, at some point, we are going to change this to uh, the, uh, going away to alpha and it end up going to be just v1. Um, but we'll keep uh, backwards compatible uh, soon. You need a name. That's just a name of this resource. And the resource here is a deployment of RangoDB. And I need to specify what kind of deployment do I want. I mentioned before, we have three kinds of deployment, single and cluster we already talked about. And we have also something that is called active failover. And that is just something in the middle between single and a full cluster. But let's concentrate on the cluster here. This is how you would describe it. Now, I mentioned before that these YAML things are nice and you can write them. And even though they're long, um, the big problem comes when you want to do something with it, like scaling, like upgrading. So let's scale this thing. For now, I'm doing it on paper. And uh, if we have time, we come to the demo. So scaling, let's say I want to have a lot of storage. Um, then I'm just saying, instead of the default 3DB servers, I want seven. So I set the count here to seven. I do a kubectl apply, and kubectl is the standard tool uh, to deploy stuff to Kubernetes. And I apply this file again. Um, and now the system notice, hey, you wanted something else. Before you said three, now I want seven. So apparently I have to do something. So what the kubectl operator is going to do is it's going to make the difference between what it had and what you want now and say, OK, you want the count to go from three to seven. So we're going to add one, and we're going to add another one, etc., all the way until we reach seven. Scaling down, exactly the same principle. Obviously, we just remove machines after some careful consideration. Now let's upgrade. Let's say that uh, Arango DB 3.3.14, that's the, the current version. Let's say that you uh, started with Arango DB 3.3.13, um, like a month ago or so. And you now want to upgrade to this one. You just say, OK, let's take the new image with the new version. And there is actually an interesting aspect here that um, Although I'm here explicitly putting a version number, in the end, this is just Docker image, which is found on the Docker Hub. Um, and that tag, because the version is the tag part of the image name, that can be anything. Um, so we don't really know what version it is. And we had to be smart about that as well. So upgrading, again, just set a, put in a different image. And as you can imagine, I mentioned before that this upgrading is complex because we have to do it in the right order and stuff like that. Um, so the operator that we wrote now starts working on this and says, OK, you want 3.3.14. We now have 3.13. What are we going to do? So we are first going to replace an agent. If that comes up and everybody's happy, we're going to the next one, etc. So we're going to replace all the different containers in such a way that you don't have downtime. That's our primary goal. We don't want downtime. Um, and obviously, if you bring one server down and replace it with another one, that can mean that um, your uh, performance goes a bit down because you have less querying power and stuff like that. Um, so maybe you even want to scale it up and then upgrade. But that obviously really depends on your load that you have in your system. So. We did an upgrade by just putting in one line and creating one command. Um, that's really nice. So let's talk a little bit about how you access the database. Um, as I mentioned before, you have these services. And that's the way of Kubernetes to talk to a um, resource. Um, 
And here we have the primarily, if you don't do anything, we provide you with cluster internal access. And that means that if you have your own application, whether it's a website or gaming site, whatever it is, running inside the same Kubernetes cluster, you can just talk to it over a dedicated DNS name. Um, but sometimes you also want access from outside your cluster. For example, if you want to take your browser and talk to the database, um, because our, our database provides a, a web UI as well, if you want to do that, then that's outside the cluster. And you cannot use the DNS internal names of a uh, Kubernetes cluster and just talk to it outside without some smart DNS logic. Um, but Kubernetes has taken care of that, and that is by different types of services. That can be load balancer, that can be node port, um, and we actually provide both. And what the operator does is that it does not only create a service for you that you use inside the cluster, it also creates what we call an external access service. And that will automatically try to make a service of type load balancer. And if that fails, and there are reasons for it where it can fail, it will make a type node port service. And then you have outside access. Obviously, there are cases where you don't want this and you just set it to none and it's not set. Um, so I mentioned load balancer can fail, and that is that the, the fact that your Kubernetes cluster can create a load balancer is a feature of your cluster, and not every cluster has that. So if you're running on the Google Kubernetes, it creates a Google load balancer for you. If you're doing on AWS, you get an AWS load balancer, etc. But if you're doing it on your own uh, bare metal setup, you don't have a load balancer by the at least unless you create some additional stuff. So we try to create a load balancer. If that doesn't work, um, fine, we create a node port and you can still access it. Do keep in mind that when you talk to that, we do TLS by default. And that's the biggest mistake that we have seen our customers make. They say, well, I cannot connect to my cluster because they are curling to the DNS name and then the port name without HTTPS. Then it doesn't work. Um, Storage. Let's talk a little bit about storage. As you can imagine, storage is probably the most important thing for a database. That seems pretty obvious. Um, and ArangoDB, like any database, really loves locally attached SSD, as fast as you can get them. The faster, the better. We cannot be emphasize that uh, hard enough. Um, now, here's the problem. Um, Kubernetes, by default, in its at least in its um, the way that typical cloud providers like Google are offering it provides you volumes that are network-mounted volumes, which is nice. Uh, and if you have, uh, don't have that many uh, performance requirements for your I.O., it works perfectly fine, and there are lots of benefits of doing it, but it's really, really bad for a database. Um, so we had to do something there. Um, because we, while we know that some providers do provide you with uh, volumes that are actually mapped on locally attached SSD, a lot of them are not. Um, so we provide a Arango local storage resource and also an operator to actually do something with that. Um, that is a resource as well, um, which you can create and it will create volumes for you on the nodes of your cluster. So assuming that you have SSD on the nodes of your cluster, if you have very slow spinning disks, don't even bother. Uh, but if you have uh, fast SSDs on your nodes, this is the route to use. This is how it looks. Um, again, we have some API version and a kind that's, of course, slightly different. We have a name. And the most important is the local path on your nodes. So if you have mounted a fast SSD on all of your nodes, create a mount them on a certain path and put that in here. Um, and then what this operator will do, it will create volumes underneath here. So there are some subfolders in here and it will just mount some uh, volumes uh, in there for you. Um, obviously that means that now your container is suddenly fixed to that node, um, which is bad or good, depending on how you look at it. It's good for performance because it's the fastest that you can get, but moving that around is really bad. And that's one of the reasons that 
um, underneath uh, the ArangoDB operator is creating pods and if the pod dies because your node is restarted, we know, okay, this is on the same, there is a volume on the same node, we can either stick there and just create a new one on the volume or we have to start moving the data somewhere else or recover the data from somewhere else. And that is what we can do in a cluster. Um, in a cluster you have in all your collections or your database collections, um, you have a replication setting and you can say, I just want my data to be stored in two places. So if one dies, no problem whatsoever, you, we just migrate it from uh, the one that still had it and everything is fine. Um, so obviously, if you want to use this, don't use a replication factor of one because you can be screwed. If that nose dies, then you have a problem and there's nothing that you can do about it. Let's give a short overview of what we already have in our operator. Um, we support all our deployment modes. We have automatic TLS, um, so everything is HTTPS, colon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have automatic authentication in place. Um, and you can have, and that's an optional one, you can have locally attached persistent storage. And finally, we have what we call DC to DC, or that is data center to data center replication. That is another feature of the ArangoDB right now cluster uh, deployment, where you can have a cluster in data center A and a cluster in data center B, and then say asynchronously replicate in one direction. Why do you want to do that? Either because of uh, you don't trust that data center, if that one burns down completely then you still have a copy over there. Um, but the other reason why you want that is um, if you have a global application, then it can be very helpful to have your data available locally. Um, so for example, let's say you have your application and you have a data center in North America and you have a data center in China. Um, now all your reads can be done locally. Your writes still have to go to one because the replication is only going in one direction. Um, but for most applications, um, the reads are the majority of operations. So at least for your reads, you have your data locally. We, uh, we support that now in Kubernetes as well. It's just another line in the specification say, oh, by the way, I want the thing replicated. And with a custom resource, you configure it that it actually starts talking from data center A to data center B, which is nice. And eventually this will also support, completely support Kubernetes Federation, but right now that's not uh, the case. How do you install this thing? Let's have a quick look at the time. I will hurry up a bit. Um, obviously the operator has to run somewhere as well. Um, that's a piece of code which is in some containers and it needs deployment as well. Um, Right now, if you go to the release page, there's one option. If you wait for the next release, there will be two options to install this. The preferred one is Helm. Helm is the default package manager for Kubernetes. And it's really easy to work with and really easy to tweak. And the second one is uh, kubectl apply and then with a couple of resource files that we give you. Um, that's all that you have to do. It takes a couple of minutes, not even a couple of minutes, typically one or two minutes and it's done. And after that, you can start deploying your custom resources. Now, we said in the title of this presentation, we said this is for DevOps. So it's not only for developers, it's also for operations. Um, so we have to make, we did make sure that you can monitor this system as well as possible. So where can you look? Well, obviously you have the logs of everything. Um, that's easy. Um, you have the status part of all the custom resources. We tell you when you deploy a Arango deployment, um, you can ask for its status um, and describe all kinds of events. So when we say, when we detect that a pod was dying and we replaced it with somebody else or another pod, um, we create an event for that. And all of that information is available there. And I think, in the end, most important, um, we support Prometheus in a very big way, uh, which is just measuring certain counters and stuff like that. And you can make them visible with Grafana on top of that. Um, it sounds like, yeah, this is nice, but maybe I only need that when I'm doing heavy production and I want to tweak my load and stuff like that. 
We have learned so much by having Grafana during our debug sessions, you cannot imagine. Um, because then you suddenly see a spike there, which you cannot explain for, from what you're doing. And most likely that means that something there is happening that you either didn't expect, so your expectations are wrong, or you have a bug. And obviously we make, also make a lot of bugs, so in most cases it was just a bug. Um, but that was really helpful, and I think that for even for your, um, if you are not already in production, make sure that you have monitoring monitoring on that because it's really helpful. Finally, about what the thing actually does, we support a couple of providers, um, and a provider for Kubernetes can be Google, it can be AWS, it can be Azure, um, you name it. Um, and here's, here's the problem that we have. We say any Kubernetes 1.10 or a higher um, cluster that you have, you can run on, no problem. Um, but then there's a big but. And the big but is um, in order to get there, you have to path things like authentication, how to talk to your Kubernetes cluster. And those things we have found out the hard way are pretty different for, for example, Google on one side versus AWS on the other side. AWS also has a Kubernetes engine. Um, if you compare that with the ease of use that you get with Google, um, it's pretty much night and day. We have spent a lot of time just figuring out the authentication of, uh, um, authentic or, or authentication of the cluster access on AWS. That is just hard. Um, so what we see, and that's also what we um, talk to our customers about is which cluster are you on? Are you on Google? Are you on your own bare metal? Um, it doesn't really make a difference for QPerango to be our operator in the end, but in for us to help you set it up in the right way and ask the right questions if you have problems, we need to know which provider it is. And we are therefore also testing heavily on the various uh, providers. Right now, um, as of the next release, we'll mark uh, production ready for um, Google Compute Engine. Uh, and the other platforms are still ongoing testing. Um, does that mean that it doesn't run there? Absolutely not, it runs fine. Um, at least we don't know of any issues yet, uh, but we haven't passed all our acceptance tests uh, on there. And as I mentioned before, Federation is not yet available. So let's quickly... Um, take a deep dive into this thing. Um, first of all, what, what does this thing look like? Um, if you really want to know the details, go to our GitHub page, around GitHub slash AranguDB slash CubeAranguDB, and you find everything there. Um, we have multiple operators in a single package. So we have three different custom resources, one for deployment, one for setting up the replication between data centers, and one for local storage and all of them have their own operators. And for various reasons, we have chosen to package all of those in a single image, but still have different deployments. Um, that just made it a little bit easier. Um, and for the various custom resource definitions, like the around the deployment, uh, you'll find there a Go, everything is written in Go, a Go structure uh, that defines the specification, that defines the status, etc. And as anyone who has written a operator before will know, there is a lot of generated code. Um, one side that's helpful, uh, on the other side that makes it annoying to build because your compile times get bigger and stuff like that, but that is what it is. Um, of every operator, for example, take the operator that takes care of the wrong deployments, we deploy two instances. Um, and actually one is only working at the same time. The other one is doing a hot standby. Um, we found that when a node goes down, even though this is a deployment, so Kubernetes will schedule another one if your container dies, um, we found that just having another one standing by is a lot faster and we can quickly, much quicker um, run uh, and start solving problems if for similar reasons pods die. Um, Good. Well, a lot of code is shared, and finally, we talk a lot about uh, we are heavy users of Finelize, so I'll come back on that later. Let's have a little bit look inside here around the deployment operator. Um, 
it creates some members, and a member is just an other way of saving, saying this is a server of a certain type. So it can be, for the cluster cases, it can be an agent, DB server or coordinator. And for a member, we create a volume, we create a pod when it needed, etc. And that's actually the key part here. We have a single inspection and control, control loop per deployment. Um, that means that the operator is constantly, well, more or less constantly, looking at, I have my specification here, this is the current state of the system, is everything still fine? If so, fine, we sleep for a little bit of time and we try it again. If not, we act on that. Um, and in order to make that um, actually work in a way that uh, we didn't lose our mind on debugging it, we made it in several layers. Um, and let's have a look at those layers. Um, the, I put them here the highest, but it's actually the lowest layer is the resources. So that just makes sure that pods are there, volumes are there, etc. Then we have reconciliation. That is, hey, my specification says I need seven. Here I have three. Now I need to do something. Um, could be creating members. Um, and finally, we have resilience. And resilience is a layer that looks at the entire system over a longer period of time and um, figures out things like, hey, this server now crashed for five times within two minutes. What's wrong? Let's do something about it. Um, so all these layers have a different kind of responsibility in the overall system, and that helped us a lot in just um, making this thing work. A note about finalizers. Um, we put finalizers on any, any resource. And a finalizer in Kubernetes is just a label that says, you cannot delete this resource until this thing is gone. Somebody has to actually remove that finalizer. And we use that um, as a kind of restriction for, you can think of it as a garbage collection. Um, we can only remove a volume that has certain valuable data if we know that that valuable data is saved somewhere else. Um, so we keep a finalizer on it and we have these checks to make sure that everything can be done right. It's really helpful. It saves a lot of problems, but also makes debugging really hard. Because if you screw something up during debugging, you end up manually removing all these finalizers and that's just not fun. Uh, but again, that's our problem. Let's have a look at the, let's see if we can make it work. I'll do, try to do this very quickly. Um, is this somewhat readable or should I probably enlarge it? Right now I have here a, um, I have a cluster on uh, Google, uh, Google Kubernetes and right now these are the, the, the four pods um, that I have running there. And as you can see, we have a deployment operator twice and we have a deployment replication operator twice. So right now I have not done anything in terms of deployment of um, databases, I just have operators deployed. And now I'm going to do a kubectl uh, apply command. Um, oh, should be in the right directory. kubectl apply. What I'm now running is um, I'm applying a simple cluster uh, YAML file. I can show you the YAML file. Uh, let's do a cat. It is probably not really readable in the back, but it is more or less the exact same that I showed you on one of the earlier uh, slides. In order to see what's um, going on, I have a watch of kubectl get pod um, that I'm running in the above. Um, and what you can see is it, um, besides the four pods that you have, what we had initially, you can now see it has an example simple cluster ID. I make that a little bit bigger as well. Let's see if that works. Now the ID will be gone. And the ID pod, um, initially, I, uh, earlier in the talk, I mentioned something about these Docker image tags containing a version or not. 
And that's actually a problem because we need to know exactly which version it is if we want to have the right upgrade rules. So what we do for every deployment is we first launch a single container in the most simple and quick way that we can just to ask it, give me your version. Then we kill it. So that is a very quick container and then we know the version and then we know, okay, this uh, image and then we have the, the right uh, SHA hashes, etc. We know the image and we can work with it. After that, it starts a couple of pods. So we have uh, three agent pods, three coordinator pods, and three primary pods. The primary is just the old name for DB server. So that's where the actual data is. So they are running right now. And now I can do a kubectl get service. And then I see here all the services that I have in my cluster, where some we already had. But now for example, simple cluster, that is a cluster IP type of service, meaning it's only available inside my cluster. But the good news is um, I also have an example simple cluster EA, external access, which is of type load balancer. And if I now go to, um, I have to take the right one, the external IP address, um, I can access the service. Now, in order to do that right, I mentioned before, we have TLS, um, which means that every connection between every component in the system is uh, secured with a TLS connection. And for that, you need certificates. Um, we don't ask you to create all these certificates. We don't use Let's Encrypt. We create them ourselves. Um, so they are self-signed certificates. Obviously, you can provide your own if you want, uh, but just to make it easy, we create them for you. So if I now open this one in a browser, my browser is going to complain like crazy that this is not trusted. So in order to make that a little bit less annoying, um, I'm going to in my, um, I must type it right, example, simple cluster. So what I've now done is um, I, have, I have some aliases for that. So. Uh, uh, I won't share you the details because it's really uh, annoying, but I have asked Kubernetes, give me the CA certificate for those um, uh, TLS certificates, and I have installed them locally in my system. So now when I open, uh, let's take this URL. So now when I open a browser, it should complain less. It will, let's run that one. It will still complain, even though I installed it, but I installed it and then it uses, it used the internal DNS name. And here my browser says, you're trying to connect to that over this IP address and that doesn't match what's in the certificate. So do you really want that? Yes, I really want that. Where is my mouse? Here it is. Can we, uh, why don't I get, for whatever reason, it doesn't respond. Let's take in a one. Somehow I think my UI is now blocked. Let's see if we can redo that. and it complains, and it will complain again. And now I have reached the web UI of my cluster. And if I log in there, it is still complaining that I'm not, I didn't have all the three uh, cluster certificates right yet. Um, that's the downside of Opera. It's a little bit slow in synchronizing with the certificates. You can see I have three coordinators, three DB servers. You don't see the agents in here, but my cluster is up and running. And I can now start um, creating collections if I want. This is now all running in a Google Kubernetes cluster um, somewhere in Europe. I don't even know exactly where. Um, and that's basically it. We can start playing with this. Um, and we can start upgrading it uh, if we want. We can do all kinds of stuff with that. But I fear 
that my time is limited. So I suggest that we, we can you, you go to the questions quickly. Um, so first, some closing words. You can deploy a RangoDB very quickly now on Kubernetes. You saw it, it took me, what was it, two minutes, and we have a cluster up and running. Um, and I didn't have to write any long YAML, just a couple of lines. Um, an interesting side effect that we had of creating this thing, that it turned out that Kubernetes is a really, first of all, a bug magnet for ArangoDB. We, you have no clue how many bugs we found in ArangoDB just by running it here and trying to get this resilience business completely automated. Um, because if you don't have that, then Kubernetes can be fairly unforgiving. And it was also a feature magnet. We didn't expect that. And one thing that I would like to um, give an example on here, for example, is load balancers. Um, we have, as you can imagine, in a database, you do a query and then you get back a cursor. And with that cursor, you can fetch all the uh, requests or, or all the remaining data that's in there. If that is a small set of data, no problem, you get it in a single request. If that is a large set, um, then you have to, ask, have to have go multiple requests to the server in order to fetch it. And what we had before is that for every request, there was a little state on a coordinator in memory um, that says, well, for this cursor, I can still give you the rest of the data. So this suddenly means that you have to make sure that your request that you initially made to fetch the query or initialize the query, and then the second request that you make to get more data has to land on the same coordinator. Now in here, we have all kinds of load balancers. A service, even the most simple service, is already a load balancer. And it doesn't tell you which coordinator it lands on. So in order to make this hap uh, happen, we added some functionality to the cursor support to actually understand where the request came from. And if your follow-up request doesn't land on the right coordinator, it will automatically um, pass it on to the one that actually has your data. Um, so now you don't have to care about that anymore. But this was one of these features that we didn't think of when we started this whole project. Um, but in the end, it made things better. And even now, if you don't run Kubernetes, if you put a load balancer in front of an ArangoDB cluster, no problem whatsoever. You can just use it. Final closing words, distributed systems are just fun and complex, but let's start to keep it with fun. Um, some links, obviously you can just um, uh, go to GitHub and go to the documentation, etc. And if you ask questions, please ask. Thank you very much. We are hiring. If you are interested in Kubernetes, please talk to the woman over there. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, now is the time to ask them. <laughs> questions, anyone? Yeah. Um, you that there are Can you pause it along? Uh, so we mentioned that there are three modes of RangoDB, this uh, single mode, basically the failover and the cluster. Yes. And I think you talked mostly about the cluster, yeah. which is totally understandable. Um, but let's say if I run, could I, I also could run this in failover mode. Right? Yes. The operator would support me there as well. Absolutely. Um, how would the upgrade path then look like? Um, it will do pretty much the same. It will first, um, in, in active failover mode, you need... Uh, typically five containers, because you still need uh, agents, three agents, um, and then you have three, uh, two uh, servers, and they do an active failover between the two. Um, and it will first upgrade uh, the agents one at a time, and it will then do um, the uh, two remaining servers. It will upgrade them, and which means that one of them is the leader, um, and Whichever one you take first, it doesn't really matter that much because the other one will notice right away. So the remaining one will notice, hey, I'm no longer, um, my leader is now gone, um, so I'm taking over. Um, and 
The first one will be upgraded. The second one will be then brought down, which means the first one will recognize I have to become leader. So it's pretty much the same process. Other questions? So you mentioned um, that the current way of installing it is like um, you give us some YAML files and we can do uh, kubectl apply. Yes. But you also mentioned Helm that it's but it's not completed yet. Is there some kind of timeline when to expect this? Uh, next week. No, seriously, the, uh, we currently have it in a pull request uh, and we know it works. Uh, we just have to merge it and put it in a release. All right. Okay. Um, so that's really coming really quick in the. The, the only topics that it's still hanging on is finalizing all the documentation fixes. But the, um, just to give you a comparison between the two, um, if you do a kubectl apply of the resource files that we provide you, then for example, the operator is deployed always in the default namespace. Um, with Helm, you can configure that, uh, which is great. Um, and you, with Helm, you can also say, I'm going to create the operator multiple times in multiple uh, namespaces. Um, that's true for all uh, two of the operators, the deployment and the replication, uh, because the local storage is always deployed to the cube system uh, namespace. But there are lots of, um, I think you have a list of probably 15 settings that you can tweak in, um, in the Helm uh, uh, chart. Um, obviously, you could also tweak those things in the YAML resource file that we provide you, but that's just more work and, and it's much more complicated. Um, last question, um, Kubernetes has this node affinity uh, feature. Yes. Um, is there a way to tell the operator uh, to include basically a definition or my, my understanding of, I want node affinity, for example, the, the components of the cluster setting, uh, the cluster setup that um, need persistence? Um, is there a way to um, give this to the operator so it can... Yes, you can do that on two levels. You can, first of all, in the um, if you uh, use the Arango local storage resource, um, you can have a node selector in there um, so that you can limit it to certain nodes already. And the second thing is that you have uh, is for the Arango deployment, you can have per group of servers, so that is agent, DB, whatever. Uh, you can say, well, I either use a node selector or you can um, use these uh, tames that are now being used more um, to have some affinity as well as anti-affinity to certain nodes. With that, you can um, create deployments where you, for example, say, I run my agents on these three boxes that I really, really, really care about and all my database things are being deployed on nodes where I have big SSDs. No. Thank you. Other questions? Then I thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, um, please contact us, and if you're interested, please talk to us. There are lots of people here also with Arango shirts, and if you want, we have some Arango shirts here as well, so come by and take one. Thank you very much. <laughs>